Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, and thank you so much for being here and listening today. Today's episode is actually a bit of a special one. This is the 100th episode of the podcast, and it's pretty wild. If you had asked me when I first started this if I would have been able to reach 100 episodes, I would have doubted that that would have been possible because it was definitely a bit of a grind getting started with this and, uh, you know, trying to coordinate interviews and all that sort of thing. It can be a challenge, but I'm super proud of all of the things that we've been able to accomplish so far. And to be able to hit 100 episodes is definitely something that I'm really excited about. And I'm really excited that I've been able to help you guys throughout your journey with learning all of this stuff and to be able to see some of the great comments that you guys have sent me, some of the emails I've got, some hear some of the great recordings that you guys have made as a result of listening to these episodes. It definitely makes my day and I'm just super grateful, super thankful for all of you who have supported the podcast, supported Master Your Mix, supported my programs, my coaching, and support me. And I'm just really excited for what the future holds because I know that there are plenty more episodes in the work and I'm not stopping with this anytime soon. I've just had way too much fun and I'm just super grateful. I definitely do want to give some shout outs though because there are some people working behind the scenes that make this possible for you guys and to to help make this podcast a consistent regular thing. So I definitely want to give some shout outs to Marcy who has been hugely, hugely helpful behind the scenes, helping me with some of the guest coordination and definitely helping with a lot of the editing. It's been a massive help to have him and definitely this podcast would not be consistent without him. I also want to give another shout out to Borna, who was one of my earlier podcast editors. Also to all the managers who have helped to coordinate some of these interviews as well, because some of our guests have managers, and so we go through them. And certainly to our guests, who have provided so much amazing insight and value to this podcast, and who have been able to tell us some amazing stories and share so many lessons along the way that I know have helped out a ton of people who listen to this. So... Definitely couldn't have done this without them. And then last but not least, I've already said it, but again, thank you so much to you for listening to this podcast. And I'm always excited to be able to serve you guys and help you and provide a lot of value and help you put out more music because I just know that there's so much great music you guys are working on. And any way I can help you guys to get that out, I'm just super excited about it. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I can't wait to keep this train rolling and get more episodes out for you. So with that said, let's jump into today's episode, and today we've got Bobby Ozinski on the show. And if you're not familiar with Bobby, Bobby is an audio engineer, producer, musician, public speaker, and author based out of Los Angeles, and he's probably best known as the author of over 20 books that cover various elements of the music industry, including music recording, social media, audio engineering, surround sound mixing. Like, he has really, he's very prolific with his books, and you should definitely check them out because he's got a lot of great stuff. And over his career, he's also worked on hundreds of 5.1 surround sound projects and DVD productions for a lot of big superstar acts. He's done projects like that for artists like The Who, Willie Nelson, Neil Young, Iron Maiden, The Ramones, Chicago, and so many others. This guy really knows his stuff, and I think that he's a perfect guest to have on episode 100 today. I'm just really excited for you to listen to this episode. So that's enough talking. Let's just jump right in. Bobby Ozinski, thank you so much for being on the Mastery Mix podcast. How are you today? Oh, great, Mike. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. For people who might not know your history, I mean, you've been around in this industry for a while and you've done a ton of amazing things. Can you give us that story of how you got into music and ultimately all the steps that you've kind of taken along the way to get to where you are now? Well, I've had multiple careers in the music business, which some people are lucky to have one. I think I've had three or four, but it all started as uh, I was a musician. I was playing in bands and I came up during a time when there was a lot of clubs that you can play at. So I was playing in clubs and making money four nights a week when I was still in high school. And then at, uh, in college it was more, and then I was touring. And, and then um, next thing, it moved to Los Angeles. Well, there's some steps in between, actually. What happened was I decided I, I was in a fairly big area rock band to sign a major record deal and we went into the big New York studio and then I found out just how mediocre of a player I was. Didn't realize it until then, but it's funny how the studio does that, right? Especially when you work with an engineer or a producer that's like really on top of things, it makes you realize like where you have to, where you have to step up your job sometimes. Yeah. it, It was a slap in the face for sure. But 
at that point, I decided that I really needed more chops, and I also needed some background because I wanted to be a producer. So I went to Berklee College of Music, but I had a, a degree in electronics, and while I was in this band that was signed to a major label, we just we started to record in the label studio, which is very, very nice. And I started to record their demos. So I got a lot of, of recording chops, courtesy of the light records. And then um, when I got to Berkeley, I was a student for a couple, maybe three semesters, and they asked me to be a teacher in the production side of things because I knew more than the people that were there. <laughs> so um, I was a teacher for a while, maybe a year, and then I walked into the teacher's lounge one day, and there was somebody ranting and raving saying, oh, this is a place for rookies or has-beens. And it hit me right between the eyes. It's like, I don't want to be either of those. So I packed up everything, quit the job, and moved to California and moved to Los Angeles. So I started as a guitar player, arranger, producer, any job that came my way, I took. And eventually that led to me playing more and more and with some better people and better sessions. But w there was something that happened that actually sent me into my second career. I was on a tour bus and the bass player came on one day and said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. Now the music paper was a big music Every week, it would come out in New York City, and it had everything about the music business. It was very cool. I wish it was still around. But something really hit me, and it was like, uh, you know, I think I could do that too. So I started to put feelers out, and, and that got me some jobs writing for magazines. So uh, next thing you know, I was writing for all the popular magazines, probably about a dozen of them, everything from Billboard and Variety to EQ to wow. Recording Engineer Producer to Grammy Magazine. And uh, I was writing articles, and I was interviewing a lot of people, which is kind of key to everything else. And <clears throat> I was still recording while I was doing all this. I was still producing, and I was a very good recording engineer, but I was mediocre at best at mixing. And after a while, I realized that if I didn't get better, I was not going to progress in the industry. So thankfully, because I knew all the best mixers, because I was interviewing them and I was running into them. So I went to the 25 best mixers in all different genres. And I asked them, how did, how do you do what you do? And they told me, and I kept on saying, are you sure you want to give this away? And <laughs> the general answer was, yeah, nobody can do it like me anyway. So I got to be a pretty good mixer at that point because I was learning the trick from the best. So I, since I was writing as well, I thought, you know, I bet there's a lot of other people like me and there were no mixing books at the time. There's no information on mixing at all. Mm -hmm. So I decided, maybe I'll write a book. And everybody said, no, you can't write a book on mixing. It's too subjective. But I gave it a try anyway. Wrote the whole book, sent it out to five publishers. They all wanted it. And I went with the most aggressive one, and it became the Mixing Engineer's Handbook. This was in 1998. It came out in 1999. And... Because there's no other books, it became a hit. And next thing I know, it was in colleges and production company, you know, just everything all over the world. So that led to a second book, Recording Engineer's Handbook, and a third book, and a fifth book, and a tenth book. And a, <laughs> so next thing you know, I, I think it's been 27, 28, something like that, that I've done. Not all in the music business, most of them, though. So that becomes another career. And then probably the fourth career would be, you know, you write a bunch of books and you go, you know, I don't know if there's anything else I, I'm really keen on writing, but I have a lot of knowledge about this one subject, which is mixing, 
and maybe I can do some courses. So I started to do some online courses, first of all, for lynda.com, which now is uh, LinkedIn Learning, and then on my own, which have, has been very successful. But it's led me into yet another thing that I never realized I was going to have to learn, which is online marketing. So next thing you know, I'm learning about Facebook ads and I'm learning about you know, branding and just, you know, everything. And the thing about, thing about it is I've been lucky because I've, I've happened to know some great people in all of those industries that really helped me. So, you know, I had the advantage of that where many people, you know, if you're, where I came from was a little town of 5,000 people in Pennsylvania, Minersville. And at, at the time it was, no one ever gets out of here. So there's, you know, you never thought about making it in the music business because nobody ever does. Now it's possible. I mean, you can be in a small town like that or smaller and and get all the information that you need and actually make a mark for yourself. But it wasn't that way back then. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, I, I love your approach to all of this with all of those different careers with the approach of like just trying to find the top people in those areas, whether it was in the marketing side of it or whether it was in the mixing side of it, like just even being able to um, acknowledge kind of your gaps in your process and to, to be like, okay, I know that the fastest way to do this is to go to those, go to the top people and learn from them. I think that that's something that a lot of people these days, they're just like, well, I'll just try to figure it out on my own on YouTube or something like that. And they don't really think that like they can access people who are willing to actually help them, you know? Well, don't get me wrong. I did that too. And, you know, you flounder for a little bit. And the thing about it is, I, I'm, again, I'm really lucky because I knew many of these people just from meeting them. I mean, being in Los Angeles, the, there is one advantage if you go out at all. And if you meet people, you do meet the right people after a while. So that's what happened. Especially like on the digital marketing side, I used to do just the online side, let's say. say. Um, I used to go to a Saturday morning tech breakfast. And that breakfast had attorneys and tech gurus and everybody in the tech side of things and maybe switching over to entertainment a little bit. But for the most part, they were... Uh, the, not the founders, but some of the original people in Google and in PayPal and in Facebook. So I got a lot of information from them, you know, back when everything was first starting. Now, a lot of it is now old news and doesn't quite work. But in the beginning, it was really helpful because I happened to know these people from breakfast. But mm-hmm. Lucky. Yeah, that's amazing. But I mean, it also... It, there's something to be said for like getting in early and also adapting to the changing technology and all that stuff too. Cause yeah, you may have learned early on, you know, how to market yourself online in the early days. And now it sounds like, you know, you're still having to constantly adapt with the times and, you know, go deeper into Facebook and like, you know, Facebook mark or Facebook ads that they change like every day. So, you know, it's like learning how to do that. It's, it's constantly a big learning process. So, you know, I guess just keeping, keeping with the times and finding the people that, know what's going on and trying to just dig in as much as possible. It's, it's so important to, to maintaining your success and keeping relevant. Right. Yeah. Mike, you know, the other thing is I did everything kind of as a one man band for a long time. I, I've been in businesses where I've, you know, run groups of people and everything, but uh, I've tried to stay away from that for a long time. And just recently things like the online marketing and the, um, Facebook advertising and things like that. I've laid off to yeah. people who are better At some point than you me. can outsource and that makes your life a lot easier too. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a, that's a good level to get to, right? That means that you've taken the right steps to get to that point. So yeah, that's definitely key. Um, do you find that with the content marketing side of it, you know, putting out these books and having the, your podcast and, and all the other stuff that you're working on, have you found that it's actually helped you grow your uh, production and mixing business as well? Like, do you feel like that's, it's been a good way to get your name out and to, to draw up some business from that? Yeah. To be honest with you, one of the first things I did, let's see, 13 years ago, I started my first blog. And the idea behind it was nothing more than, than branding. I wanted to brand my, my name. And then the second blog came out. The second, the first one was just music production. 
The second one was about the music business itself, which included social media. And the whole idea was I wanted to brand me. I didn't want to make money out of it, and it's still like that. So consequently, it did get me a lot of work. Uh, I don't take as much as I used to because, frankly, I'm too busy these days. There's just so much going on that uh, it, it's hard to get away for a project, unfortunately. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's one of these things. I'll, I'll do a project if I really, really, really like it, and it's going to be fun. If there's any indication whatsoever that there's going to be a hassle, <laughs> then it's like, uh, there's something else that's more fun that I can do. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good position to be in as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. As opposed to, I have to take this job because I need to make money, and we've all been there. Of course. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I feel like there's a lot of people listening to this who are in those early stages of trying to market themselves or, you know, get into the studio business. And, and a lot of them have no clue where to start. And, you know, I, I like how you put it of like, you're, you're focused on branding yourself and making your name known. And you took all these different avenues for it. Do you feel like that's still a viable path these days for people who are getting started? Yes. But in a different way, for instance, when I started my blogs, blogs are, were just blossoming. So they were very big for a while. And then, you know, for, after a while, that trend kind of fell off. And I used to walk around a trade show and everybody would say, I love your blog, I love your blog, I love your blog. And then it was, I love your podcast, I love your podcast. So, it, you know, it changed. It changed the podcast. But I think now it would be social media. But again, the real problem with that is you have to find the right platform with the, that has the people that you want to reach. And you have to approach it differently. You have to approach it not as a user. You have to approach it as a promotional tool. And that's a different mindset. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's providing value for people more than mm -hmm. anything. And, and I think if you can prove that you're a valuable person who knows enough, then people, I mean, people will listen to your mixes and think, oh, man, like that, that guy can get those sounds that I like. But also that person also has the experience and knowledge that can maybe, you know, they can pass off to us for the next steps or whatever. And I, and I think that that is really important for people to to like. I think a lot of artists are looking for that these days because there's just so many avenues to go through and it's hard to know which ones to, which ones to go with and how to do a lot of these things too, right? The problem with having so much information is it's information overload and you don't know what's good stuff and what isn't. So uh, that's, you know, sorting through everything is a big problem these days. Yeah, for sure. So what, what kind of things do you do to make sure that like you're sorting the information properly? Because, I mean, there is so much stuff out there that it can be overwhelming or, or misleading and, you know, especially forums and that kind of stuff these days. It's hard to hard to trust what you're reading sometimes. I follow fewer and fewer of them, I have to say. Uh, one of the reasons why is just a time issue. <laughs> you know, you can go down a <laughs> rabbit hole and, and it's hard to come out of it. So there, there's, there's fewer and fewer things. I'm more concerned about what I do rather than other people. So, I, for instance, my whole day is about generating content. It's not absorbing content. The only reason that might change it did yesterday for instance all of a sudden i had a final cut problem that just popped up out of nowhere it made me crazy so i had to go online watch some videos and see if i can sort it which i did so again that that's one of the times that i, I might make an exception but uh, i don't necessarily look online or entertainment like other people. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess there's something to also be said for entertainment versus information and sometimes. And sometimes it's easy to just fall into that trap of being entertained and it just, you know, spirals from there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to say, like, you, you definitely seem like you're a busy guy and you've definitely spoken about that. Um, you know, how do you manage all of your time so you can do everything? Because for some people, it's, it's, you know, it's a really hard thing to manage. And, and especially if you're trying to get into this industry and do all the things that seem like the right thing to do, you know, it's, it's hard to find the time to do all the stuff. Well, scheduling in a list really helps. Like, for instance, I know that every morning, my first two hours are going to be reading emails and doing my social media that's going to post the next day. 
That's my first two hours of the day. So it's rare that something can take me away from that. And then I have a list of things I have to knock out. So I know this, 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 and I just keep on going down the list until they're finished. And of course, that list rolls over over till the next day because you don't, you know, you don't uh, always get through everything. The one thing I can say that there, I do have a rule: I don't take phone calls or few texts or anything when I eat. The, the only time that's really my time during the day is if, if I'm eating. So, I, you know, I just look <laughs> at that as uh, that's that's something that's non-negotiable. Other than that. I'm rolling like everybody else. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it, it makes it a lot harder to have a phone conversation when you're eating. <laughs> I hate it, to be honest with you. My One of my best friends, and he's one of my old friends, he always does that to me, and I always mention it to him. And he goes, oh, oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, after all these years, you, <laughs> you should yeah. know that it bugs me. But anyway. <laughs> Maybe he just does it on purpose now. Yeah, just to bug it could be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right on. Well, I mean, so so another part of it, too, I'm sure, is that with all of these different things you're working on between the production side of it, between the writing and content marketing, all that stuff, I'm sure a lot of it is a matter of just creating efficiencies in your processes as well, right? And and so that you you can work faster, smarter, and, and not use up as many hours. And maybe some of that is the outsourcing that you're doing. But what are some of the other ways that you've created efficiencies in your process? And maybe even if just we talk about like the mixing side of it, that might be helpful for a lot of our listeners. Yeah, well, the mixing side is all templates. You know, once you put a good template together, you, you can pretty pretty much start from there. Well, I've talked to guys like Billy Decker, who's the ma- one of the masters of that. Oh, yeah, Billy's great. I've had him on the podcast before. Yeah. And Billy has different templates that he starts from, depending on the type of music. And I don't do that. I, I just have one template that I start from. But it really does help. It really makes things go a lot faster because you're set up and ready to do it. So I think that's the most efficient thing. The, the second most efficient thing is doing a prep work beforehand. The prep work being going through all the things that we hate to do, the cleanup, the renaming and and it's you know a big problem where you'll get four tracks in it'll be joe one two three four well uh, what does joe do (laughs) you know so you have to go in and figure out what that is and where they're at okay that's guitar chorus guitar line so that helps too because once you do that then you can easily go for what you need rather than having to think oh what was that now yeah, for sure. And how much of that stuff are you doing personally, or are you trying to kind of prepare it? Like, are you tr- are you sending any information to your to your customers, your clients first to say like, this is how I expect things to be submitted? Like, are you creating efficiencies that way as well, or, or are you just kind of handling it on the back end to do it the way you want it? No, there's there's a document that nobody reads. So, <laughs> <laughs> I I always believe that. There's so much that has to be done before the mix. And it used to be like this, to be honest with you. You got a mix, especially in the analog days, you got a mix that was pretty much ready to go. There may be some things, that, well, we're talking on on analog. We had a track share a lot of times. So, you know, oh, I have an empty spot there. I'm going to put it, you know, I'm going to put a tambourine there, <laughs> you know. So you had to mark that. But the track sheets and everything were really well documented, so that helped. And things were cleaned and, and comped and ready to go. And now what happens is that extra production step is ignored, and it, I don't understand why. So a lot of times, and every mixer I talk to has this problem, and there'll be 10 guitar tracks that will come in, and you look at it and it will go, Close guitar, 57, uh, 47, um, uh, <laughs> three inches away, two feet away, boom. And you go, well, why didn't you just make that decision on you know, what you want to, it to sound like? And the, then they always come back and say, well, that's to give you options. It's like, no, you <laughs> figured this out. You know, less options is more at this point. Yeah, of course. And it's also like, you know, the, your tr- your job as the mixer is to try to make the song as best as it can be, but also to preserve the artist's sound. And if the artist 
is not clear on what their sound is and all the things that go into that, then that just makes it so much harder for you in the end. Yeah, there's a thing about arrangement, too. And there's two schools of thought on it. One school, a guy like Elliot Shiner, for instance, if he gets 100 tracks in, he feels that he should make sure that all 100 tracks can be heard. Mm-hmm. And there are other people, and I think I fall into the second category, where, where it's like, if I can help this arrangement by muting a bunch of stuff, I'm going to do it. Because, uh, you know, here's an, another common problem. You used to have people that were really, really hip on arrangement, or they had so much time while they were making the song that the arrangement finally came together. So you didn't have to worry about mutes because if something wasn't supposed to be there, it wasn't there. Now what happens is, oh, and as a result, everything had its own space. It had its own frequency space, and it had its own space in the mix spatially. Now what happens is it goes kind of the opposite, where it's like, well, I'll just play through this whole thing, and then you decide mm -hmm. where it should go. It's like, mm, uh, it doesn't work that way. That just makes things a lot harder. Yeah. And then also, you get used to listening one way, and then it's difficult to listen another way. So, it, you know. Very true. Yeah, demo it just kicks in. You can't escape yeah. it sometimes. Do you think that that is kind of the problem with digital recording these days? Whereas, you know, to your earlier point where, you know, a band back in the day used to write a song and sometimes it would take them months to get into a studio. So they were just playing the songs over and over again. And I'm sure each time they did it, they realized, oh, maybe we can clean this up. Or, you know, all, all of these arrangement choices that you mentioned probably just came organically because they were actually workshopping the songs before they got into the studio. But now with the digital stuff, it's just so easy to, like most people have a little interface near them when they're jamming and it's so easy to just record the idea. And, you know, I guess, Demo Edis kicks in right away. You, do you think that that's what's going on? That has a lot to do with it, yeah. Definitely. Uh, you know, I have I still believe, I did a rock album, let's say, three, three years ago, I produced, and we spent, I don't know, a couple months in pre-production, working out the arrangements. So when we got in the studio, everybody knew exactly when to play and what to play, and and... Yeah, you know, you, you make adjustments. You go, oh, maybe it doesn't work as well as I thought it was going to, and you make some adjustments. But in general, you've worked out some of the big issues already. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important and something that's overlooked. Now, the way a lot of music is recorded today, that's not possible because it starts with the drum loop, and then everything gets built upon the... That loop it might not be a drum loop, it might be a, a loop of a song, and everything gets built on top of that. So as a result, you're writing as you go along. There's no such thing as pre-production because you can't really do it, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. So that that's changed our outlook, and it's changed the songs that we hear as well. Yeah. So as far as getting over that demoitis, because it is very popular these days, and I think we all get affected by it in one way or another. What are some of your tips for that? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know that <laughs> that you can... If there's something that you really like, it's hard to get away from it. And sometimes maybe you shouldn't. Maybe sometimes the demo is the record. You know, And, and that, there's a lot of cases of that, you know, in the past, where they just couldn't beat it. It's funny, I was just... I was with... The son, well, somebody played in a band with the sons of the, Kevin Cronin from Ario Speedwagon. Okay. And it just made me think of it because their biggest hit was a demo that they could <laughs> not beat. That happens with a lot of bands. I, I think I, that, I remember uh, I toured with Collective Soul years ago, and it was the same thing with their, de their debut record. It was just like some loops that they had programmed and some DI recordings and nothing beat those demos. So that was that was it, you know. But yeah, I mean, I guess you're right, though. Sometimes sometimes there is nothing to really change from that demo, and, and you shouldn't just change things for the sake of changing things. It's a matter of finding the finding what the key element of, of that mix is, or, you know, if those things are all good and you can hear things clearly and the arrangement's well done, then, yeah, you've got a good song on your hands, right? Yeah, you know, and that's one thing that happens. I, I've been lucky to work with a lot of interesting and creative people, but sometimes that gets in the way, too. There's one guy I work with, one uh, artist 
And um, he was never satisfied. We finished the song, and he'd go, you know, I think it would sound better reggae. <laughs> and we'd do the whole song again in reggae. And then he'd go, you know, it, it'd sound better if it was New Orleans, Orleans Swing. Then we'd do the whole thing that way. And, and we'd do five versions and come back to the first one. So <laughs> just because you're making it different doesn't necessarily mean you're making it better. Fair. I mean, I guess the sign of a good song would be that it would be able to translate to all those different genres, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember there, there was a uh, there was this like punk ska band years ago called Real Big Fish. And that was that was one of their stage gimmicks. They they would play one song like five different times on on stage, just different genres. And, you know, it was like kind of impressive. You're like, ah, this, this song still holds up really well, right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think they did it just more as a joke for themselves. And, and they were kind of a jokey kind of band. But but yeah, you realize in the end, like, oh, yeah, this, this is actually a good song. And that that's why it works this way, you know? <laughs> Gee, I wish I would have known that trick when I was playing clubs. Right? Just fill up a whole set with one song? <laughs> yeah, right. It would be it would make it go so much faster. Yeah. You in your book, so you got this you got the fifth edition of the Mix Eng- Mixing Engineers Handbook coming out. And uh by the time this podcast will be released, it will be out. So everyone should go check that out because it is a great book. I've read some of the earlier versions of it as well. And um I'm curious to know, like, what is new inside of that in that fifth edition? It's really surprising in that you think a lot of mixing techniques are evergreen. They don't change. And to some degree, that is true. But the technology changes. Our outlook on music changes. The way we work change changes. So as a result, the book has to reflect that. Of course. So when the first edition came out, it was just being in the studio on a console. And gradually, it's changed. The fourth edition finally was, you know, mostly in the box in your home studio. And this is completely that way. Although, you know, everything you learn can translate back into a real studio with, you know, a big console. But what was a big thing that is coming up here, and maybe it hasn't reached down to many of your listeners yet, is Dolby Atmos and immersive mixing. Mm -hmm. And... That's surprisingly different from everything else. You can't make that transition without really knowing some background on it. Whereas when we get into to mixing 5.1, that was somewhat the same, but you know, it was the same principles. Now we're talking something completely different. So that required some explanation, first of all, of how we got here. And then second of all, why it's different in a primer. I mean, I could write a whole book on on Dolby Atmos, and people have. But that being said, this is a a primer to at least get you Mm -hmm. into it. So that's part of it. That's a whole brand new chapter. There's, uh, let's see, something on on self-mastering, which I don't think I ever had before. There are some um, new balance techniques. There's one in particular. I'm pretty proud of this, actually. It's it's a a takeoff of an old method. This was a Tom Dowd. If you know who Tom Dowd yep. is, right? Famous engineer, producer, Almond Brothers, Cream, back then. I never worked with them, but I know several people that did. And I'd hear the stories that Tom could actually get a really good mix going without ever listening to it. He turned the monitors <laughs> off, he'd just look at the meters. And part of that has actually translated through the years. It was more about how, how to get your bass and kick together. And uh, what that was is on a VU meter. You want, first of all, the, the kick, whichever you start with, you know, bass or kick, it doesn't matter. You want it to set between minus five, minus seven. Minus seven just when it's soloed. So you do that, and and then you're going to have a pretty good balance. And there's other methods. You know, okay, you put this at minus 10, you put this at minus 14, and and everything, you know, works out. But none of that translated to the digital media. The reason why the meters are different. I was going to say, every meter would have, like, different calibration and that kind of stuff, so it can definitely mess with your head a little bit there, right? So I sat down and tried to work it out. I did work it out on just normal peak meters. And if you 
follow this method, you'll get a, a mixed balance in no problem. And it could be really, and I was doing it on a mix that was 60 tracks wide with horns and lots wow. of background vocals and, and keyboards and percussion and, and all sorts of things like that. And you could do it in 10 minutes and it sounds really good. Is it finished? No, but it really gets you in the ballpark fast. So I thought that was a pretty good revelation. Actually, it was a pretty, pretty good thing. That's in the book. That's amazing. That you're, you're the first person I know that has said that they've been able to do it with a full mix. You know, I've known like Jakir King always talks about like his method for like kick, snare and bass. Mm -hmm. Um, I even had Val Garay on the podcast and he talked about how he would get a good drum mix with all the monitors turned off and it was same thing all vu based but you're the first person to say they've actually got like 60 tracks done that's that's very impressive i know it works because i gave it to a friend of mine who's a really good mixer and he kind of rolled his eyes and then he came back and said you know it was better than my mix so, <laughs> better balance so i i it, like i say it's not a finished mix but it'll get you in the ballpark so that's in the book the other thing is a method for setting up your compressors so they pump with the track. Now, I've had this in my book for a long time. Why do you want it to pump with the track? You want it to pump with the tempo, the pulse of the track, because when all the compressors are moving at the same rate, everything sounds better. It feels more powerful to you. And this has been a trick that's been used for a long, long time. Most of it, and it's been done by ear before, and I show you how to do that, and I've done that in other versions of the book. But this is another way that you can actually use the numbers. So you can go in and find your delay time, for instance, and then you can say, okay, here's my delays. I know what a quarter note and an eighth note and a sixteenth and a thirty-second note is. Now I can take that and I can put that again on the attack, and I can put this on the release. And all of a sudden, without you having to think about it, there you go. Everything's pumping with the track. So that's in there as well. There's also four new interviews that I've done. And most of the interviews that I did in the past were with, let's say, classic mixers. And now I've really wanted to hear what younger mixers are doing and how mm. they're doing it. So I had Jordan Young, DJ Swivel, does Beyonce and yep. people like that. And he described what he's doing. Andrew Murray, uh, Dan Corniff. Uh, hey, Dan's great too. He's, been, he's been on the podcast before too. He's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Billy Decker. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it, one of the interviews that uh, th there's not much, like I haven't seen many interviews with him before, but it was in your, your book, uh, Jerry Finn. Like I, Jerry Finn is like probably my favorite producer of all time. Like everything mm -hmm. he worked on, I, I absolutely loved. Um, so when I saw that you had interviewed him in your book, I was like, yes, like finally, you know, <laughs> it's just amazing to read some of the insight that goes into some of these projects and you know, how they, how they set up their settings and all that stuff. It's great. Yeah. Um, there were so many interviews. I couldn't fit them all in the book. It's big already. It's thick. Just need a book full of interviews and that's it. <laughs> Could, but what I did is I took 13 of them and I put them online. So if you buy the book, you get the, the link to go online and read the other interviews. So that's uh, over 30 of them, I think. Total. Wow. That's a wow, lot of them. Cool. Awesome. One of, one of the things that caught my attention when I was reading your book was that you had mentioned, you had mentioned uh, something on the topic of gain staging. And it's something that to me makes sense in, in practical use, but I had never heard anyone explain it the way you did. And you'd mentioned that um, the idea with gain staging is to have all of your individual tracks lower than your group bus and your master bus. And do you, do you still believe in that? Like, is that still relevant in, in, I, I think I read like the, the third version of the book. So it's, it's going back a while, but yes, it, this is just good practice from the analog days. I mean, that's where it came from really. And the reason why is your meters could look okay, but there's some electronics in there and they're, you know, fader buffers and, and your bus, buffers and things like bus amplifiers that are getting overloaded that suddenly is making things sound a little smaller. And it translates to digital as well. The way I know this is when we first made the initial transition to digital, one of the biggest complaints was the mix doesn't sound as good. It sounds smaller. And the reason why was there's the belief that 
Well, it's digital, so now we can do just about anything and get away with it that we couldn't do in analog. But that turned out not to be the case. And as soon as everybody went back to using analog methods in the digital domain, things got big and they got they became the way they expected them to sound. So if you want your mix to be big and powerful, you have to be very careful about that gain staging because things are happening under the hood that you might not understand. So there's overloads going on that maybe you're not catching. Mm-hmm. So as far as gain staging when you're tracking, because I feel like gain staging, there's a few different ways, like few different applications for it. There's obviously when you're tracking and setting your initial levels, and then as far as creating your your mix, you know, creating that balance overall. So I think it's important to probably start at the beginning there. As far as tracking these days, you'd brought up the idea of using analog methods in, in the digital realm. What sort of level should people be aiming for these days when they're setting their inputs? Minus 10, uh, well, if you're looking on, on a peak meter, uh, minus 10 with peaks to minus 6. Gotcha. And then as far as the mixing side of it goes, I guess that's where that quote from the book comes at, comes in handy, where it's, you know, just knowing that you if you set your levels at, a, at that level, you'll have a good clean signal, but you'll probably have to turn your faders down. Yeah, but there's more to it than that, because gain staging means that there are no overloads happening anywhere in the signal path, anywhere. So if you're having a plug-in, for instance, that's overloading and you, you let it go, you might not hear it on one, but if you have it on three or four that that's happening, then all of a sudden things aren't going to sound a little fuzzier. They're not going to sound as clear. They might not be as powerful, especially if it's on like the drums. So that's really important. You have to go and watch those peak indicators to make sure that you're not clipping them. Now, yes, there's the school of thought that says, I really like it when it sounds like that. Well, okay, just understand, you know, what you're doing, for the final mix, and, and do it if you have to and compensate later, but just understand how everything affects everything else. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people just throw everything into the sessions and see what they can get away with. And, and then that's, you know, to your point of like mixes sounding smaller, it's just because they've, they've done too much or they've gone too extreme with everything and they've really painted themselves in a corner. So sometimes just like, I, I, lo- I love that quote that you mentioned earlier, just like using analog methods in a, in a digital realm. I think that that's so true. <laughs> just the, yeah. you know, approaching your mixes that way. And a lot of people have never um, worked in analog before. So, you know, it's just understanding like the, the way things were done sometimes is, is, is the most important thing to know. Well, let me give you the classic mix misapplication of using digital when you should be using analog. I have a really good friend, great old-time friend. He's won 18 Grammys, so he's good. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> yeah. And he, he used to have a studio out here in Thousand Oaks, and Britney Spears lived close to the studio and she had to do vocals and she decided she didn't want to go into Hollywood. So she rented the studio. So my friend wasn't going to engineer, but he decided that he was going to make sure that she had the best, finest vocal path. And he already had, you know, great stuff. He had a, you know, 1073s into LA two A's and he went out and he rented the the best C12 he could find. So he goes through this, and it sounds terrific. Brittany comes in, and she starts to sing. And my friend panics. He goes, oh, my God, what just happened? But he's looking around the room, and nobody says anything. So he figures, okay, until they say something, I'm just going to let it go. So she goes, and she does all her vocals. Everybody's happy. Everybody leaves. And he figures, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Did something break? So he goes and he listens to his signal path, and sure enough, it sounds good. And then he goes over to the producer's session, and he finds that the producer is recording with five plugins. <laughs> and two of them are compressors, two of them are EQs, one that's boosted at 3K, one that's cut at 3K, and, you know, just a lot of garbage in between. He said as soon as he bypassed them, boom, great sound. <laughs> I guess, yeah, sometimes you just have to simplify and, you know, just because we have all the, the ability to add so many plugins and have all the infinite 
connections going inside of our software doesn't mean that we need that we should be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that story. And I think that that's super important. And, uh, you know, I do see constantly a lot of people that just throw so many plugins at their chain. And it's like, why? What's what are those things doing? You know, and maybe it's just they heard a tip from someone that they use that on one session and, you know, they think that they, they threw all these different settings together and all of a sudden you're going to get this like perfect combination of everything. But every song is different. Every song needs to be treated as unique and often simple is better. <laughs> you know, I had another situation like that a few years ago. On my mix bus, I've always put the same things roughly. There's a PSP vintage warmer. There's a, an SSL bus compressor. And then a limiter. Limiters, what I've been using for a long time now, is a FabFilter Pro L2. And that just gives me the sound I'm looking for, and I've used it pretty much on everything to some degree. Well, I did this rock record, and I go to mix it, and it doesn't work. That combination doesn't work on the first song. And I found that if I took everything off and had nothing on the mix bus, it sounded great. Okay, go to the second song, same thing. Get through 10 songs, nothing on the mix bus, and it just worked. So the moral of the story is you have to be flexible and you have to use your ears and say, well, you know, this, this used to work, it doesn't hear. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting because you had mentioned that you like to use templates. So I'm assuming that a big part of your templating does involve to some degree, gain staging your tracks on the way in so that everything is consistent within that template, right? Not to the extent of Billy Decker. Okay. <laughs> but um, honestly, I've done what he does. <laughs> uh, I've had this discussion with other mixers as well. It's funny because we all look at it and go, that doesn't seem like it should work. And then we all try it and it goes, wow, it does work. <laughs> so you know his method is good it's worth picking up his book actually to to read through that but i you know so no i i don't go through the gain staging have the gain staging preset if that's what you mean but it's not a bad idea yeah no i was just thinking about that example where like that compressor wasn't working and you know wondering how much of that was maybe affected by the gain staging or or you know it's i mean it's, there's so many different reasons why something may or may not work and it could be the song, it could be the performer, it could be the gain, it could be all sorts of things, right? The best reason was the tracks were impeccably recorded. Mm. I was producing, so I didn't record them. I recorded overdubs, I didn't record the, the basics. They were so well recorded, just didn't need a lot of that stuff. There you go. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that all comes back down to the, the very foundational thing of mixing is like, just use your ears and actually listen to what's going on in the session. Because, yeah, a lot of people do use their templates and they don't even listen to what the original track sounded like. And then they're kind of reverse engineering their template to, to make it work, you know, yeah. and figure out, figure out what's going on. So, yeah, um, I'm curious to know when you start a mix, obviously, you mentioned that you have your template and that you use some of the stuff on your bus compression and that kind of stuff. Um, what is your typical mindset going into it? Like, how do you start? Where do you start? What kind of things are you thinking about in the very early stages of mixing? Finding which mix element is creating the groove and then accentuating that. And I say which mix element because you can't assume that it's going to be the bass and drums because what if you're doing something that doesn't have that type of mm -hmm. music, for instance. So uh, you have to find that first element. What is creating the groove? And then after that, it's what's the most important element besides that mix element? Maybe it's a vocal, but maybe it isn't. You know, maybe it, maybe there's something that's playing a lick that's really the main thing that's driving it. It could be that maybe there's a loop that's driving the whole thing that's creating the groove. So you, you have to go through and listen to everything to understand exactly where that's coming from. But those are the most important things. What's creating the groove? And then what is actually the most important element? that everybody has to hear. Yeah. And and is that typically like the order of things you'll work on is finding that groove first, working on the groove, and then that next element and kind of doing it that way? Because some people will just, just start from like the left of the recession and go to all the way to the right, whether that's starting with drums first or that kind of thing. But it sounds like you're kind of taking a little bit more of a, a more purposeful approach 
Well, usually it does go from the left to the right. Fair. And, you know, <laughs> depending on the type of music you're doing. And yeah, what's creating the groove is the, the rhythm section. But there are times when that's not the case. So you have to be flexible enough to go through and just understand, you know, what's what. Yeah, yeah of course. So then how do you know when you're done a mix? That's one of the most difficult things. It helps if you have a deadline. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yeah. But for me, I'll take a break and then come back an hour later and listen and then figure out if I have to tweak it. And if I tweak it and it doesn't get better, it just gets different. Then it's like, okay, this is, this is baked. This is ready to go. Or at yeah. least ready to go for client approval. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you're sending yourself or sending your clients mixes before you feel like you're signed you're signed off 100 yourself like because sometimes people it's like you just have to check in with the client to see if you're even in the right ballpark right sometimes yeah so, yeah no if it's a new client no because you want it to be impressive so they don't fire you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess they might as well get the full experience of what what you think sounds like a good mix right yeah even though it goes it might go in the opposite direction but i guess in that case at least you could say like this is this is what I think sounds like a good mix. And then you find out really quickly if you're the right person for the job or not, right? <laughs> well, everybody's been there. Yeah, of course. And and sometimes you just have to accept that that's the case. You know, we yeah. we we don't always align with the same visions of our of our clients sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Someone once told me that it'd be a great business to be in if it wasn't for the clients. <laughs> Well, I think in some respects, you know, I think these days the industry has changed so much that we don't typically have a lot of attended sessions these days. And I think that that sometimes makes it a little bit easier to, to to see your visions all the way through and give someone a chance to listen to your full vision. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I I had a case, and this is not something I'm proud of, but it's it's typical, where I was brought into, re this is back in the analog days. So I was asked to remix something, and the client was there right from the beginning. And I only got as far as the snare. Brought the snare up, and he says, that that doesn't sound like the snare sound. And I said, well, yeah, because it was a sample or it's triggering a sample. If you find me the sample, I'll be happy to, to make it sound like that. He's, and he just kept on saying, well, that's not the snare sound. Well, yeah, I know, but here's what you have to do to get that snare sound. And we went back and forth and back and forth until finally I fired myself. <laughs> and because I realized this is not going to get any better because I'm only two tracks in, <laughs> you know? Yep. Like I say, I'm not proud of that moment, but... No, but I think that that, that is something to actually reflect back on. And it was obviously the right move for you at the time and, and probably the right move for the artists as well, you know? And it, that takes some self-actualization to be able to be able to acknowledge that right no um, well i don't regret i regret how i handled it but i don't regret the decision fair yeah that makes sense and, and i guess that also kind of ties back to what we had talked about earlier about that demoitis and you know people just chasing sound sometimes that that can be a very dangerous thing and when you have a certain sound in your head it's sometimes hard to escape that and, and realize that maybe you didn't track things the way that they need to be to get that sound out of your head or, or you know or into the recording and um yeah, definitely, you know, di dissecting mixes and understanding why a certain sound sounds the way it is, is, is very important. And then spending the time to do it properly to get it into your mix is, is important, obviously, as well. Yeah, there, there's something that I've seen around online that says, um, says it all. It basically says $1,000 mix and then, or $5,000 mix, and then the comments from the client, that sounds really great. <laughs> and then hundred dollar mix, and then there's fourteen things that, that the client <laughs> wants changed. Yeah, I, I've seen that. It, it is definitely true in my experience for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right on. So, in the end, for you, what ultimately makes a great sounding mix? Well, it's something that's fun to listen to. If it's not fun, then nothing else matters. Yep, and and that could be. It's fun because of the sonic. It could be because it's just a cool groove that you, you know you can't sit still to. Maybe there's some lyrical content that's catchy. 
you know, it could be any of those things, but it has to be fun. Of course. Yeah, I agree with that. And I seem to remember in your book, you had, you had described the, uh, like the six main elements of a mix. And, uh, I, I, the, the sixth one, I believe it was like an energy or just creating something exciting. Interest. You know, interest, interest. That's what it was. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 when I read that, I was like, yep, of course, like you need that. You can't just be all the technical things. It has to sound interesting. And, uh, yeah, I agree with that. That was the advantage of talking to all of these A-list mixers, where that was a common theme that kept on coming up. It's like, well, yeah, people don't hire me just for a good mix. They hire me for a great mix. Dave Pensato once said, you hire me not to sell 4 million records, you hire me to sell 10 million, back in the sales days. And that's to take it to another level. How do you take it to another level? Well, you have to make it interesting as much as you can. Or find what's interesting and then emphasize it. It's really yeah. the point. I love that. And that's ultimately going to be your kind of stamp of your sound that you impart on a band or in the mix. And, you know, that makes you kind of, that, that that's what makes you stand out from other engineers that, that are out there. So it's yeah. definitely important. And yeah, a boring, a boring song does no one any good. So make it fun, right? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> right on. Well, Bobby, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know that you have a very busy schedule. And because of that, I'm sure you're probably working on some really cool stuff that we can expect coming up, right? So what can people expect in the future from Bobby Ozinski? Well, the Mixing Engineers Handbook 5th edition is now out. And like I say, there's a lot of changes. I actually rewrote a lot of it. So it's, I think it's better than, than all of them, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, it, that's out, and, and that's kind of exciting. Uh, my online courses, there's a couple of new things coming up. And um, like, for instance, I have um, Mixing Accelerator that I do. Mixing Accelerator, Music Mixing Accelerator is... Yes, it's an online course that takes you from A to B, and it explains all the th well, many of the things that we talked to, talked about, and also things that are in the book. But there's also the advantage that you get me to bounce your mixes off. I give you homework. You come back with it. I give you feedback, and it comes from me directly, not from somebody else. So that's I think that's valuable. Very cool. Awesome. And what's the best place for people to go if they want to follow you online or learn more about your products and stuff? You can get everything. You can get to anywhere you need. The courses, the blogs, the podcast at uh, bobbyosinski.com, B-O-B-B-Y-O-W-S-I-N-S-K-I.com. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely throw those in the show notes for people. Great, Mike. Thank you. Well, Bobby, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. So that was my interview with Bobby Ozinski, and that was awesome. I thought it was really interesting and cool to hear how he has managed to be able to get a good rough balance with his mixes without even listening to the songs itself and just how he uses VU meters to get that balance. I think that's just such a cool trick, and it just goes to show you that you can get things up and running really quickly within a mix when you know the relationships between different tracks. And when you have that knowledge, you can definitely make tricks like this where you can work really fast and get your balance going without even listening. To it. How cool is that? I also really enjoyed the stuff that we talked about at the very beginning about content marketing and how that's helped him with attracting new clients. And I can certainly say that the same thing has happened for me as well by, by being able to help you guys with your mixes. It's definitely helped me connect with a lot of great musicians and to be able to help them with their projects and has generated some, some extra work for myself. So it's just something cool to take from that where you don't necessarily need to do content marketing, but the whole idea of it, the, the, the real core of it is just being able to provide value for people. And when you can provide value for people, that means you can go beyond just the scope of providing them a good mix. And that's really important because once the mix is done, the band needs to move forward with their career. And if they have no idea what kind of things they can do to advance that career, then they might get stuck. So the more valuable you can make yourself, the more you can help these bands see success and take those next steps, and the more you can provide information for people that way, the more you can help elevate the projects that you work on and get those to a much bigger level, and also the more value you offer to stand out from competition in the area. So it's definitely something that you should consider implementing into your process because it will really help you stand out, and that can go a long way as far as getting your studio business off the ground. So I hope that you enjoyed that episode. I hope that you got a lot of value out of it. And if you did, 
make sure to subscribe to the podcast because, you know, we've made it 100 episodes so far and we've got a lot more on the horizon and definitely a lot of great stuff to come. So you definitely don't want to miss out on that. So make sure to subscribe and definitely make sure to check out MasterYourMix.com. That is a website where I help out musicians with creating pro sounding recordings and mixes from their home studios. And on that website, we've got tons of great resources designed to help make that process easy for you. Everything from books, courses, coaching programs, and so much more. One resource that you definitely want to check out while you're there is my book called The Mixing Mindset. And inside of that book, I really break down the process of mixing for you, covering everything from what steps to take, what to be listening for, how to dial in your settings, ultimately so you know exactly what to do at all times during your mix, so you're not feeling scattered throughout that process. So definitely check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and that's available at MasterYourMix.com. So once again, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode, and thank you so much for listening to all of the episodes that we've put out so far. It's been a wild ride, and to get to 100 episodes is definitely an accomplishment that I'm super proud of, and I can't wait to put out more episodes for you. So with that said, I'll talk to you in the next one. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.